well, obviously, my name is Malcolm Boyd. And if you don't know the name, fine, honey, just... <laughs> who, ca who cares? Um, but what am I best known for? Well, I mean, I wrote a, 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 a true bestseller with a million copies in print and translated into most languages. And it, it was called Are You Running With Me, Jesus? And it came out in 1965. And so after that, there was a bit, uh, there was quite a bit actually of celebrity. In other words, this is the kind of age we live in. It was news. Everybody really got involved in that. I, I still, several times a week, wherever I am, somebody comes up and whispers in my ear, you know, about the book. And so it's my connection with uh, millions of people. I was active in civil rights, but so were a number of other people. So I worked with King and one thing or another. In other words, I, I wouldn't overdo that. I, I was one of a number of people. Um, I don't know, Mark, am I missing something? Well, you've had, we're, cur uh, we're currently making a film on Malcolm's life, and it's been such an amazing life, beginning in Hollywood. You were a rising star. Uh, he worked with um, Mary Pickford as her business partner. And in 1950, I believe it was, he chucked it all because he thought it was just, you know, the tinsel under the, the tinsel, and became an Episcopal priest and was, got very involved in civil rights, more than he's letting on here. And I'm very impressed with my partner of 30 years, and in making the film, I'm finding out things that um, I didn't know. Well, I came out to Hollywood, didn't know anybody, uh, $15 a week, uh, in a, boarding house on Franklin Avenue. I think I had one shirt and I had to wash it every night and then it would dry. I mean, <laughs> uh, but then uh, I was offered a job in one of the four biggest ad agencies in the country and that was nice, that solved that. And then into the motion picture industry and I found it fascinating. And I was a uh, voting member of the Academy for the Oscars, and I enjoyed it. People were creative and crazy. I love crazy people. I can't stand people who aren't crazy, okay? So, um... Neither can I, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but then, uh, I was in my mid-twenties, and the, and the partnership with Mary Pickford, of course, was huge, and She'd been the most famous woman in the world for a decade, and that brought me into another kind of orbit of life with its own perspectives. And, and then one night at, at a big party at the Beverly Hills Hotel, uh, everybody was there, all the heads of the studios and the agents and the stars. And, and I sort of said, I don't want to be like these people in five years. Um, in other words, I was looking for meaning. And that led me two years later to um, leave and amid headlines of the day, uh, enter an Episcopal seminary and be prepare to become a priest. <laughs> oh, and he was as handsome as sin back then. I want to tell you, we've been looking at the pictures, like between, <laughs> I'm not exaggerating, like between Montgomery Clift and Marlon Brando. I'm sure everybody wanted Malcolm, but as far as I know, you kept chaste vows even then. You know. Well, the San Francisco <laughs> Chronicle once uh, called me Marlon Brando in a collar, the clerical collar. Oh, stunning, stunning. And yeah. Anyway, I never saw myself that way, and, it, and I wasn't into a lot of narcissism, and um, I, did, I, I produced two of the first TV shows in Hollywood, and a number of interesting people made their debuts. Uh, it was creative time. Well, let me just interject with a little crazy, not crazy story, but 
we were just moving in to our, when we bought our home in Silver Lake like 30 <laughs> years ago. And I'm clearing out these boxes that Malcolm had brought along. And there was this corroded, dusty <laughs> plaque. And I could, couldn't even hardly read the, you know, what it was saying. And I, so I took it into the house. It was down in the garage. And I said, Malcolm, what, what's this? What do we do with this? And he said, oh, well, that's one of the very first Emmys they ever gave. And they gave it to me. <laughs> and I said, you, you like, got one of the very first Emmys? And then you could see the wings on the, this is before they turned it into the statue. And you've been so nonchalant about that aspect of your life. So anyway, we have one of the first, I, I, I don't know where it is now. I think on your office wall. I think it's in my office yeah. somewhere. Actually, I, I haven't been very concerned about things like that. No. Uh, and if it's over, it's over. Don't dwell on it. And every, I mean, uh, uh, some people take some things so seriously, and I don't, never have. Um, I've tried to enjoy life, and I've kind of marveled at some things that have happened to me, particularly, I think, in the Hollywood uh, genre, because it's another world. And uh, what can I say? I, I, well, you weren't enjoying life very much when you met me, I must say. And that's the truth. Well, that's the truth. Well, I haven't always enjoyed life an awful lot, dear. Yeah. No. There, right. We all have our ups and downs yeah. with life. Um, I've done pretty much what I wanted. Uh, always I'd written. I wrote in the middle school. In fact, I interviewed opera stars who came to town, and I wrote them at my middle school. Uh, a lot of Lehman, the great uh, soprano, was visiting, and she sang, and I interviewed her in my little short pants. But I, I apparently I said the wrong thing to her because I asked her for her address so that I could send her a copy of the film of the article I was writing that would make her famous. <laughs> and she thought I was asking for her dress and that I was a precocious young man, which of course I was. And so she kicked me out of her dressing room, you know. Well, either that or a closet transvestite. I mean, go figure, what would you want with, her, with, with her, her dress? I mean, really. <laughs> I was moved down here from the Bay Area, where um, I'm a third generation, at least, Northern California, and I grew up in Carmel, California, and started working as a reporter from the time I was a very little, just as a kid. I worked on the Carmel Pinecone, which is California's oldest continuous community newspaper. <laughs> so I wrote articles and interviewed famous people too. Malcolm and I have an odd Bing Crosby connection, actually, but only, you know, 40 years apart or something. But. Uh, so I went, you know, from there to college and then to San Francisco State in the early 70s, where I immediately came out as a gay mm -hmm. activist. And I graduated from state in 73. Uh, no, excuse me, it's 1975. And I was immediately offered a job by The Advocate, which uh, that year had just been purchased by a very wealthy millionaire who wanted to, quote, upgrade it by hiring university-trained journalists. In other words, people like me and Randy Schultz, and we were co colleagues. Randy was on the news side. I was a feature writer. And so I worked for The Advocate for, you know, until 84. And then uh, Mr. Goodstein, who had a lot of different business interests, said, well, I think it's time to take the paper back to LA, where it had been founded in 1967. And nobody really wanted to leave their homes. But by then, the Bay Area was so age-stricken. And so many of my friends were dying at a very rapid rate, some of them literally in the streets. People would get the disease very quickly, lose their jobs. There was no AIDS care, there was no disability. People were literally, all of their possessions were being thrown into dumpsters. 
it was it was businesses were being closed it was terrible and i thought i could stay here and continue suffering but maybe the change would be good so i moved down here not knowing a soul just like malcolm moved to la what all those years before i did not, i did not know one person in los angeles but we had to keep the presses rolling on time but there was one mutual friend and he provided an introduction and so we just started to uh, date and we had this wonderful connection of the mind but i thought hmm let's see an episcopal priest 30 <laughs> years my senior is this going from the <laughs> from the fire <laughs> to the frying pan i don't know sounds like a glorious swanson uh, film to me. film it was very dramatic <laughs> and i said I, well, I don't know what to do I, mean, I really like this guy but we kept on dating and then i said but and then, well mark i want to mention our first date Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> uh, because we, uh, oh, I, I don't know, it was a kind of a straight restaurant in Pasadena, and we were going there for dinner, and uh, the, obviously there wasn't dancing, there was a pianist kind of doing uh, smoke gets in your eyes for people with a martini. And then I said to Mark, would you like to dance? And I said, sure, because, you know, coming from San Francisco, that we danced in the streets. I mean, it felt very natural. So anyway, uh, panic. Big People mistake. are dropping the silverware and screaming, and we somehow paid and left. Oh, it was a biblical flight for the exit of the restaurant. I remember it was all made out of red bricks, and people were looking just shocked. You know, this was in 1980 by then 85 or something. So by then we, we kind of figured out that we were but, hooked. But I want to go back to something here too. Okay. Uh, because Mark, dear. Yes, dear. <laughs> you mentioned um, 19, kind of 80? Four. A four, okay. What I get out of 1984 is uh, that I had come out in uh, about 79, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't like being a basketball star and being lauded by the New York Times and everybody kissing your ass. It was hell. And it was also a priest. And what, didn't the Bible say that was sinful? So in other words, I didn't have any friends at that point. Uh, uh, employment was out of the question. Uh, I mean, it was really hell. So I had the coming out that today is kind of this glorious thing that everybody can make a movie about. At that time, it was purgatory. And people don't know that or they forget it or they don't want to hear it. Well, honey, you're going to hear it. Yeah. From me. Well, working for the advocate at that time, I know how few celebrities were really one could come out. I mean, we could get people like Bette Midler or Lily Tomlin to be on the cover yeah. and say, you know, gay, gay people are our best friends and that's okay. But to try to get an authentically well known or famous person, somebody who had and talented in the field to come out and share the good news was very, very rare. And then in Are You Running With Me, Jesus, there was the prayer, I'm with you, Jesus, in a homosexual bar. And Time Magazine uh, ran it, but without comment. In other words, they thought that kind of said enough <laughs> and they didn't need to say anymore. <laughs> so, so it was a charged environment. Um, and I had to find my um, place in the world again because um, I, uh, um, I mean, are you running with me? Jesus had placed me in such an enviable, such a <laughs> prestigious, such a safe place, if you like. And that was stripped away, you see. So 
I was exploring the meanings of it. it. It helped a lot to be with Mark because he knew everything about it, where I didn't. And so uh, living together, uh, obviously, I like, picked up on that most, a great deal of it well, and I, found out. I, I think I also helped Malcolm to normalize the experience because I, he was very quick to, well, let's, you know, um, get an apartment together right away. And I said, wait a minute, I want a proper courtship. And, and you got it. And you, well, let me finish my story. So I said, <laughs> you're going to go home and you're going to visit my family and my relatives in Carmel you know, just because it's only 350 miles, so I was always going back there for a visit. I said, you were going to go to some of my favorite beaches where I grew up as a chi child, and we still go and visit in Big Sur and Point Lobos, and I said, you're gonna take the historic Adobe tour in Monterey, where I, which I was a student docent when I was in high school, mm -hmm. and you're gonna learn the history of the town that I came from, and. And I did. And he did. And, and also Mark's family loved me. Oh, my grandmother just adored Malcolm, I mean, my siblings, <laughs> and so when all of this process of normalization. Uh, we gave it time. Gelled, and we gave it proper time. Mm -hmm. We knew it would last. But then I think finally one night we're in a restaurant and uh, he's sitting across the table from me and I got up and knelt and, yes. get, and presented the ring to That's him. That's a ring. And he accepted it. Oh, there was not the same restaurant as the one in Pasadena. This was a very cool Oh no, this was a... French restaurant. Fr yeah. And people around us like, Clapped. Plotting. Plotted. <laughs> <laughs> it was very, very sweet. So then we began. Oh, well, then, of course, we had to have a place. A house. To live. And these awful dumps we were looking at. And then it was late in the day, and the real estate agent was a saint, wonderful woman. And she said, there's one place. I didn't know whether to show you or not. And of course, we fell in love with it. And it has remains. Uh, is, I mean, I adore that house. And we've had a wonderful a time there, you know? Uh, well, it's like a little enchanted cottage, and it's just one block down the street <laughs> from the original Walt Disney Studios where they made Snow White. So go figure, you know. And then the church came around, in, in yeah. fact, in the diocese, certainly of Los Angeles. That took a while. Yeah, but then the bishop uh, blessed us in, in the cathedrals. And uh, that was 2004. Yes, that was a huge date. And um, we'd settled into our life together. As I mean, it's just as a part of my life that I had never had a childhood because my father was an alcoholic and a womanizer and it was a wreck at that time. And later as a young priest, uh, uh, of course I presided at his burial. And, but also uh, we had had, uh, I guess you'd call it a reconciliation, an understanding, we came together. But it was the, um, you hit on something, the normalization of our relationship that I know is so important to Mark, too. Uh, I mean, we'd, we tried not to live at extremes with crises, in, uh, with paparazzi, with... We just tried to make a life. And our home is a lovely home. It's the home I never had as a child. No, you never had a home. I do now. Well, yeah, you do. Uh -huh. See, I grew up really, I mean, I w had, of course, what I call, um, uh, aside from being a journalist, I went back to graduate school at one point in my life and became a trained clinical psychologist. So I'm very much into the stages of life and you know the developmental stages. So around 11 or 12, like most 11 or 12 year old kids, I obviously, you know, had some qu inner questioning or doubts. 
But uh, throughout my life, I, n I always knew I was gay, and I never had any problems with it. I mean, I had a gay brother, and we would talk about it a lot, and we said, well, this is cool, this is fine. And we had a, uh, on this, you know, in the, I was born in 1952, so this was the 50s and 60s, so there wasn't much public discourse about it, and what there was was pretty negative. But we were very fortunate to grow up mm -hmm. in Carmel, California, which is a small, liberal, artsy community. So there were a lot of queerish people, a lot of artists. Some of our high school teachers were obviously gay and lesbian people. My father introduced me to a lovely gay couple who ran a, a, a theater, a very prominent theater in the community that was kind of the community's pride and joy called the Tanamont theater and uh, uh, he said, uh, you need an assistant for weekends to show, they showed old movies. Here he is. And I was really impressed because they had had quite a former careers, uh, very renowned puppeteers. And when they told me that they had met Greta Garbo, well, I want to tell you <laughs> that kind of <laughs> knocked my socks off. And I said, well, mm -hmm. what was that like? So I grew up, you know, hearing these stories and, uh, and with from very uh, interesting, queerish people, but it seemed very normal to me. And um, I was just a regular kid. I had a paper route. I was the editor of the high school newspaper, big brother of my family. I mean, you asked how I identify myself, what is my greatest accomplishment in life, and that would be being a good uh, big brother. And that's how I kind of feel towards uh, Malcolm. That's how I feel towards the community after 40 years of mm -hmm. ceaseless activism. I mean, I came out pretty much in, in high school. I did not date girls. I was, uh, well, to be honest, I was a virgin until I moved to San Francisco and got laid on the first night I moved there. <laughs> I went down to the stud bar and met a sailor who picked me up and boy, we had a great night. And I said, okay, this is what I've been waiting for. But uh, I did not date, there was no pretense. At some point I refused to go to PE class because I did not want to be bullied. Mm -hmm. And I let my feelings be known to the principal of the high school and he said, no, we won't let that happen. He said, so you just go to the library instead so during that period, I would read, um, uh, I don't know, Langston Hughes lived in Carmel, so I grew up reading the collective works of Langston Hughes without even really knowing who he was. Since... Um, I, I think I read one of your books there, Malcolm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I did. Well, since... Um, I mean, my history would, was different then because there wasn't any... Uh, anything positive in terms of my youth about being gay. Uh, also, there was the uh, divorce, the lack of family, the lack of home. Um, and I didn't have any uh, help, and there wasn't anybody, and there wasn't the best friend. And in fact, there were a couple of boys who were beautiful and talented and wonderful people. But we could, I mean, this was beyond the pale. Because I remember with one, I, I said in high school, you know, we seem to be doing everything. Why don't we go steady? Well, he never spoke to me again, of course. So... Um, this, uh, this was in the 1930s, because there were not any dates. This, yeah. this in the 30, I was born in 23, of course. So we're talking about the 30s. Um, when I got to Hollywood, um, I wasn't really interested in, um, well, I had no idea of anything gay, really, except maybe a, a something rather grotesque or rather difficult or ugly. Uh, it wasn't very appealing. And so I pursued a career rather than uh, any kind of personal life. But then later, uh, I did feel, uh, fall madly in love with a European monk whom I adored. 
a very beautiful man. And we couldn't go anywhere. I mean, there was no way to do that. And that broke my heart. I mean, literally broke my heart. Because if, if you love someone so totally and, you know, can't do anything about it. Um, to this day, he is my only rival. <laughs> In memory only. Well, um, then later I had a, well, there were a couple of periods of, of a lot of people and men and uh, particularly uh, periods when everything was going badly and I was striking back and, you know, I'll, I'll top you with glamour, I'll top you with uh, way out stuff, you know. But there wasn't too much of that. Uh, there was a 15-year relationship with someone who ultimately uh, didn't wish to come out and couldn't, and I understand that. And so then I left. And, and there was um, another relationship of about five years that was more surface and play and a very sweet man. But that's been kind of that part of my history. So with Mark then, it's been very serious <laughs> with me because it's been home, the home I never had. It's been family, the family I never had. It's been marriage, the marriage I never had. It's been a lot of things. Well, I just have to tell you how Malcolm and I really first met. This is so funny, I mean, the, how our lives passed. Um, when I was in high school, you know, and I was a very serious, budding young journalist with my clipboard and editor of the high school newspaper, which I think twice in a row, two years in a row. And my favorite program in the late afternoons where we lived was the David Frost program. Now, probably that's a name most people don't remember, but he did a very serious, like, interview program. It was a huge show. It was a huge show, and it was yeah. syndicated. So I think and in my neighborhood, it came on around 4 or 4.30 in the afternoon, just enough time to finish my last class, get on my little bicycle, drive down Highway 1, and we didn't live far off of Highway 1. This is a very scenic, beautiful part of California. And um, run home and turn on. Back then, of course, we only had three channels. <laughs> <laughs> Channel 7 or something. And uh, this afternoon was particularly important because my favorite mu musician of all time from that period was the Indian sat satire player, Ravi Shankar. Sh Shankar. And he was going to be interviewed by David Frost. But instead he got bumped by this kind of rather angry, diffident, Episcopal priest. Ah, the Episcopal ah, priest. Ah, Episcopal priest. And, but I stayed, I, I watched, and I, of course I wasn't an Episcopalian or particularly re religious. I, mean, I was uh, very interested in Buddhism. There was a very big Buddhist community on the Monterey Peninsula. So I later did a lot of Buddhist retreats, and I consider myself still basically to be Buddhist in my religious orientation. And we have Buddha in the garden. And Buddha. Now, when we first, and, um, and then later when I got involved with the radical fairy movement, very, I was one of the very first generation of radical fairies, so there was that pagan element. So when Malcolm and I met, they didn't quite know, the Episcopals didn't know quite what to do with me. Episcopalians, so, dear. I call them Episcopals, okay. I know, the <laughs> Anglicans. <laughs> But they, uh, I soon found out behind my back, they were referring to me as an Episcopagan. And I said, well, that's okay. I mean, Alan they Watts. They all love Mark. Yeah, I mean, I was fine. I mean, Alan Watts, the great Alan writer, Alan Watts, was also a Buddhist and an Episcopalian. So I thought if he could put the two together, so could I. And I have. So it was a very com comfortable mm -hmm. mix of philosophies, and I do the Mass, and it means a great deal to me. Um, I'm a great believer in 
all the good works that the church does, and particularly our diocese here in Los Angeles is just wonderful torch uh, bearing for the freedoms of all the gay and lesbian, transgender, bisexual people. It's amazing. I never thought I would live to see such a liberal attitude in a church. So I'm very proud to be an Episcopalian. Of course, I never thought that it would be possible then to be in love, to be married to a man, to be accepted as a couple, uh, that your whole life would be revolved around that. That didn't seem remotely possible at a point. And that was a hard time because if, if nothing is remotely possible that's good, you, you tend to uh, make mistakes, you tend to strike out, you t tend to be hurt professionally, you tend to be angry. And that's leading nowhere, kids. Just isn't. Because we're here rather briefly anyway, and, and I think uh, to make sense of it and to find happiness is terribly important. But, but so darling, no one is perfect, so, you know, it takes work and commitment and sharing, you know, like learning how to share your toys, as it were. We've learned to share our toys. Yeah, your beliefs. I mean, every night before we go to bed, I have a little altar place on our mantle, and I light my stick of Japanese incense. Mm -hmm. He which, does. Uh, without fail, because that is bit my Buddhist practice has been since I've been 18 or 19 years old. And I'm not going to stop doing that. But, you know, I'm a, I've learned, I've known so many wonderful poets, and particularly from the Beat era. So, it's, you know, I learned very early to, to how to put the one or the two into one, mm -hmm. and not to be mutually exclusive. That it's better this way to uh, not merge, but to, you know, we're both our own per, per person. I mean, as authors, we write about completely different things. Uh, we have different tastes when we go to art museums, mm -hmm. but um, we're together. And we've been together for what? 29 years, I guess. Almost going on 30 years now. It'll be 30 next year. So, and that's not going to stop. Okay, my name is Mark Thompson, and you've been getting a lot of personal history, but I think as an author, I would be best known for my 1987 book, uh, the first of, I think, eight I've done. Uh, it was called Gay Spirit, Myth and Meaning. And in 1987, it was really the first book to really talk about all of the various ways and permutations that we gay people could come to, to spirit, to, to faith, to the world of belief. I don't mean God, because that is a very abstract, but um, faith, belief, belief in ourselves. I, I remembered when I interviewed Christopher Isherwood, I've not to sound pretend, but I've interviewed just about everybody. <laughs> Um, but when I interviewed Christopher, Christopher Isherwood, right at the end of the interview, he said something very profound to me that I remembered. And he said, you know, we we're talking about the woundedness of gay people and why it is, how we can fix that. And he said, the problem there is that if you have not been loved, then, if you, then you don't know how to love. And you feel that to be loved is to be betrayed. And in love, then you end up betraying others. Obviously, I'm paraphrasing him, but that's basically what he said. And then the second thing that someone said to me that really registered is when I interviewed Harry Hay in 1979. It was for the uh, 10th anniversary Stonewall issue of The Advocate. And even the editors of The Advocate had kind of forgotten who Harry Hay was back then. But I, I was still living in the Bay Area, and I said, well, no, I want to do this interview with this great man, you know, who founded, more or less, 
the, the, the very, the, I can't say he founded the movement, but he founded the first ongoing gay group in the history of the United States, the Mattachine Society, right here in LA. Very important. And was later ostracized by his own group, and he and his partner had to go out into the desert, literally. And so we were trying to bring him back. And so I flew down and you know, spent the day with him. And he took great pains to explain to me how being gay up until this very recent time, that there was no such thing as gay people. I was kind of using the word, you know, this is the gay pride issue. And he said, well, wait a minute, let's back up. We didn't have the word gay back then. There was the word homophile or the word homosexual, which meant that you weren't really a complete human being in your own right, but rather you were some deviant or perverted, mm. broken mirror or uh, aspect of the heterosexual norm. Well, as you know, I knew then, but as all this new wave of gay and lesbian scholarship has sh shown, that there is no one normal, consistent thing. I mean, heterosexuality is as much of a social construction as homosexuality. Mm -hmm. And that we gay people have every right to be who we are, proclaim our love, have our healthy relationships. But being gay doesn't mean that we're some broken aspect of some, uh, somebody else's uh, figment of imagination. So Harry was very, very clear. And, I, and then both gentlemen, I interviewed Christopher, it was a few years after I interviewed Harry. I said, well, H Harry, how come we got the, the word gay? And he said, well, when you know Stonewall happened and everything, and the headlines, he said, the word homosexual was, was very long for headlines, so they needed a, a shorter word. So that's, the, I mean, that was his theory. And then when I asked Isherwood some years later, well, I said, I said, do you like the word homosexual? He said, oh, no, but I much prefer the word gay. You know, he's, I'm trying to talk as Christopher did, and he says, you know, homosexual, it's such a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> so for different reasons, both men at that point were really preferring the word gay. I think the younger generation now in their 20s maybe are going for the word queer. But you know, I don't find that so unusual because that's the word my brother and I used to describe ourselves growing up as kids. Well, then maybe I'm 20 because I like queer very much. Yeah. I like LGBTQ, a lesbian, gay, uh, whatever. <laughs> well, some, some people say the Q is for questioning, but I think it's for queer. But it was interesting uh, because I was going to, well, a lot of people have written about was Jesus um, homosexual, which is kind of stupid. Oh, no. How, however, what Jesus was was clearly queer. Mm -hmm. And actually, homosexual probably wasn't a word that would be tossed around very much when Jesus was around. But uh, he's one of the queerest people in, in the history of the world. So queer then is, well, it's creative, it's different, it's, uh, it's very challenging. It's combining opposites. It's combining. It's um, including certain aspects of gender. Oh, yes, yes. Um, Jesus remains a very mysterious figure, really. Society hasn't been kind to Jesus because it society kind of does good housekeeping with Jesus. I mean, you know, the, the kid up the block who plays tennis or something. Um, it's a little more than that. Uh, Malcolm won't see any religious movies. Oh, I hate them. It, but I love the Ten Commandments. It's one of my favorite old movies. But I remember when they made, uh, it was not a very good biblical movie with, I think it was with Jeffrey Hunter playing Jesus, and they had to shave his armpits, armpits yeah. on the cross, and even that, that was a little like, I went, oh, come on. <laughs> you know, obviously having, I, 
uh, I can remember. I was an apple from the tree that didn't have far to, to roll. You know, I just went like about 100 miles up the coast from the Monterey Peninsula to San Francisco to go to college right when, you know, the gay revolution was hitting the city. And it hit with a bang. I mean, there were bathhouses and bars and, and par party. I mean, we were also very serious activists. But fueling that was our sexuality. People forget that being gay then was also considered to be a part of the sexual revolution, and just not a revolution of lifestyle or ideas. So there was a lot of sexuality happening in many different forms. And who knew that just you know, within a decade, this awful virus. Now, I knew by, I really did as a journalist, by 78, by 79, that early, I could smell something in the wind. And I remember talking with Randy Schultz and some of my other colleagues at the paper. We were recording some very unusual early deaths. They said flu, odd things, suddenly people that, uh, you know, San Francisco is a very compact city, so we all kind of knew each other, and then all of a sudden somebody isn't there. Well, where are they? Well, their family took them back to the farm to die in the Midwest. And I said, something awful is about to happen. Mm -hmm. And it did. And it came with a terrible fell swoop. And I lost three partners in, in sexual partners. I mean, I was a serial monogamous back then. And uh, three boyfriends, one right after another, just died. And I'm sure that was around the time I contracted the virus, probably through one of them or something. I remember, like I think it was the winter of 79 or 80, I had a terrible flu-like symptoms, and that's probably when I was seroconverting. So I have lived with AIDS for all of those years, and I'm one of the lucky ones. Hallelujah. I've done every kind of alternative uh, therapy until we had the protease. I've buried nearly all of my friends from that era. I'm one of the last surviving members of the, of the original uh, staff when I joined in 1975. My beloved gay brother, Kirk, died in my arms in 1987, just a few months before the meds came out horribly of AIDS. And a little secret that people don't want to talk about, there were so many assisted suicides going on. It was horrible. And I'm still very angry. And I'm still very upset. And not just at jerks like Ronald Reagan, who never even mentioned the disease until the seventh year of his presidency or how we were stigmatized, that people thought that if people could get AIDS if we, from tears. I mean, we're, people were actually wearing T-shirts by the uh, mid-'80s, you know, disease pariah. People don't uh, ha understand the, the mindset. The non-gay community, as well as, I think, aspects of the gay community, has this willful ignorance not to remember that this was our holocaust, you know, not to trivialize what happened to any other group, but we were being wiped out en masse. It was horrifying. We were all very scared. We didn't know what to do. It was, it was a true onslaught. And I just kept on telling myself, just stay as well as you can, with any plague like this, it's always about 10% survive. I'm going to be among that 10% so I can bear witness, so I can tell the stories, and I can tell the 20-year-old kids today that if you're playing around and not using safe sex, you are an idiot. You would not want to have to go through what I have had to go through all the treatments. Do you know how many times I've been stuck with a needle? 
how many hundreds of test tubes of blood have been taken out of my body, how many pills and drugs I've had to be on. But the one thing that has sustained me beyond all of this, I say, the love of a good man, but also some internal core belief that I will survive, I will bear witness, you know, because somebody has to, and I want to. And I don't feel shame for having AIDS any more than I had shame for, for being gay. It's just something that happened. But, you know, for a young person today to still not take responsible, so we didn't know back in the late 70s. I mean, AIDS wasn't identified as a, vi you know, a virus until, what, 82? <clears throat> so, but now you know, kids. And if you're still, I'm sorry, fucking around without wearing rubbers, you're idiots. And there's something morally I find very um, reprehensible about uh, your actions. It's a tough one to talk about. But we can't forget. Well, I think the gay uh, experience <coughs> is so profound. Uh, I mean, it, it came upon a, a, a group of people <laughs> who really had perhaps no way to understand history and their own part in it. Also, there was nothing worse than to be homosexual in America. It, it superseded anything else as, as simply unforgivable, horrible, uh, diseased, sinful. It's amazing to me in a way that uh, we even hold our heads up that we have any uh, self-confidence because and then, and then you've still got some of these dinosaurs around, but I think they're really not that important anymore. Um, it is an opportunity for the population generally really to grow up, I think, isn't it? Uh, I mean, look at what we did to black people. Look what we've done to Latino people. Look what we've done to women. Native American. Rape, all, everybody's being raped and murdered throughout the world. It's absolutely, it, 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 there's something really wrong with us at this level. And I think that as, as, as gays, uh, we can be instruments here of very significant change. Uh, you know, to grow up for Christ's sake. I think Malcolm and I both feel that to our core, that in terms of evolution, history, you know, the progression of humankind, yeah. that there's a deeper secret or purpose or point of, of why so many people are coming out as uh, gay, GLBT, if you will, I'll still just stick with queer, it kind of takes care of the whole <laughs> Michigas and one, one word, you know. But there's, there's got to, I, I always feel as a writer and as an observer that there's reasons that for things and everything has its time and its season. So wouldn't you? Uh, oh, yes. If you look at obituaries, which I do find kind of fascinating, and not just be, I'll be 90 in the, June 8th, you know, which is rather close. Let's laugh on that one, too, because what the hell are we talking about? Everybody's something, and to hell with it. <laughs> but the thing is, um, we um, have to grow up. And this is a moment. I, 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 think, I, think, we, I think we are help. Uh, helping people to grow up about something very important here. Because if we just start looking at each other in a different way, 
this is where biblical fundamentalism is so tragically wrong and uh, murderous and has killed so many people. A tragedy is when, look at history, um, look at the Holocaust in Germany, if you will. And then that's difficult to talk about because of the way that a number of people feel that we're treating Palestinians in Israel. So this gets very complex. But, but the point is <clears throat> looking at anybody and making judgments. And, I, and uh, I've noticed, I really feel that we aren't doing that too well. And that includes the way we look at older people aging. We, we're, uh, I mean, that can be an awful stereotype about that. There's an awful stereotype about youth who are supposed to be destroying all morality. Uh, you know, I, so, so we do this to each other. And then I think a serious question for me right now is the treatment of women globally. Uh, the, uh, the existence of rape and the practice of it and the rage of it is, is one of the most serious questions in the world right now. So this could be a moment when we could grow up if we wanted to, don't you think? And what I feel about the young uh, gay kids that are coming out today, that they bear with them the hope and the future of the world. And that many of them, I feel, intuitively know this. But we need to help a number of them if they're being bludgeoned and tortured and uh, kept in place by prejudice and by the misuse of everything, including organized religion. Uh, it's a moment really to grow up. And I think this is a moment for us to realize in our brief lifetime, of course it's quite brief, but damn it, we have a responsibility. And that would be my message, to uh, meet that responsibility to our fellow human beings and ourselves. And if we're just tortured by guilt and confusion, uh, get help, you know, wake up. Uh, but don't talk about these things anymore in the old way. I think we have to find the new way to talk about them. I think it's important to, to be uh, an activist, to be active. I know I'm not trying to say I'm back in my day. I mean, that seems like an eye blink away. But when we came out in the 70s, we were having our fun and going, having our parties, and yes, there was drugs and all of that. But we were very, uh, for the most part, we were very serious and determined that we were going to make the world better. And not just better for gay people, but hmm. the environment. So many of us were as much concerned about environmental issues, Native American issues, the issues of women's rights, I mean, we felt that the gay, coming out as gay, really st st stitched us together with these other major concerns in the world. So I think it's important for gay people when they're coming out now, not just to come out in a tiny way or a ghettoized way, but to be thinking globally. You know, and I'm sure that that's happening with the social media and revolution that's taking hold. Well, Mark has touched on something that I feel very strongly about. Uh, I feel that single issue people are wrong. Mm -hmm. They bore me to death. And usually they're so angry and they want their name on the headline and they're really fucked up. So I wish they'd grow up and get out of that. In other words, the single issue people are, is, you can be so strident and there is no single issue is the point. And so if you're serious, there are multiple issues and, and there, there isn't any way to say one is, here's one and here's two and here's eight. You've got to deal with the whole bunch of them and how they're related. 
but, because they are all interrelated. But coming out pridefully and hopefully and healthfully as a, as a gay, queer person can be the golden key that can lead you to all of these places and to see the bigger picture and determine some course of action. We, you know, we can't take it all on, but we can do something every day where we live and we can use our, our gayness as a very powerful conduit to focus our attention and our energy. Well, th that. therefore, I think the point is, don't live for yourself. Join the world, join the community, be a part of the world you're in until a truck hits you. And I know a lot of people who are getting an F on this, who are failing. And the opportunity is there, the door is wide open. But, but the, the point then really is the multiplication of issues and the relationship of issues one to the other. So you can't avoid this. This is the, the, really the ultimate truth and, and the ultimate reality contained within our gay experience. That's why I really wept tears when the crystal meth epidemic really swept through the gay community. It mm -hmm. seems to have abated a little bit, but about 10 years ago, it just seemed to be everywhere. And I know it's yeah. as big a problem for the uh, non-gay community because it's so cheaply made and readily available. But I said, no, not, please, not again. Let's yeah. not seek out our own self-oblivion not right when we were at this sacred point of collectively, see in the 70s, the mantra was, come out, everybody come out. Don't be afraid, hold hands, come out wherever you are. And we did, and it was like a snowball rolling down the hill. And now that, now that we've accrued this incredible mass where there's not one family system or family unit or however, that doesn't have some identifiable gay brother, sister, aunt or uncle or parent or grandparent within it. So now we are known. We are no longer these mysterious creatures, you know, that get, get locked up in these books, be, you know, behind uh, gla glass cases and libraries. I don't know if you remember that, but Anytime I, well, I was still, uh, I love libraries, and I wanted to look myself up, and but I could never get the goddamn key because they're <laughs> always in these locked cases. Well, the <clears throat> the doors to our self knowledge have been unlocked. Well, therefore, I think the answer is in the positive and not the negative. Yes, and I think the negative is to ghettoize oneself to hate the world, to feel that the world is out to kill us, not to be a part of the world, not to be a part of major issues. Uh, to me, this is self-destructive and this is leading nowhere. What I feel is important then is to be positive about it, to take a, a, a stand in the world about multiple issues, including one's own life, and join the world. Okay, I think we're We've said that. Yeah, but, it, but it, we need to say it from every rooftop at midnight with the horns going. Oh, not again. <laughs> okay, enough. <laughs> or harpsichord, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, any other questions, Andy? I think we've made our point here. At yes. least I felt I have. I think Malcolm has. Not. I think so. Have you got some burning? Uh... Actually, I've given a great deal of study <laughs> to this very question, and it's reflected in my body of work, and of the work of fellow scholars such as uh, Will Roscoe, to name one, you know, out of many. I mean, there's this whole school of writing now, looking at how does our gayness affect our, our identity, our, our spirituality, and, uh, yeah, we're the same as everybody else. We, you know, want to have a nice house. We, if you're a guy or anybody, I think we're all wearing pants. You put your one leg in at a time. That kind of stupid thing, you know. 
But how are we different? Yeah, there's this one way that we're really essentially, crucially different, and it's that little difference that is so telling because we're lovers of the same, not the opposite. That we are in love with uh, uh, somebody who is really uh, uh, our own reflection. So there's almost like a doubling, you know. Um, I love women. Uh, I've, women seem to adore me. I have no problems with uh, with women. I, I, I just I don't want to live or share my life with a woman. I'm in love with Malcolm. So when I look at Malcolm, he's reflecting a part of my inner soul construct, a part of my psyche that is uniquely uh, my own. And that creates a different kind of, of you might say, uh, energetic mm -hmm. uh, force, being a lover of the same rather than the lover of the opposite. Now, I'm not going to get more complicated than that. But if you start thinking about it in that terms. Let me throw in something here. I just wanted to say that reading obituaries I find uh, very instructive. Um, because <laughs> obituaries uh, reveal uh, all sorts of gay people. And. Uh, Gosh, a number of them have written a number of operas. Uh, some of the greatest books are working with uh, underprivileged youth in the slum. Are, uh, I mean, doing all these incredible things. Uh, I mean, pure, true leadership, like, true, pure examples. On an altruistic level. So that's another yes, yes. part of our gift. Yes. Some people don't believe in altruism, but I believe that is one of our fairly unique perspectives, mm -hmm. that we do things not always just out of self-interest. We do it because, A, it needs to be done, or we feel some calling to make that happen. Well, this is what I think obituaries are revealing, because you keep reading the thing about the, the, the person who is volunteering and is doing the job and is and then you have in the third paragraph uh, the gay identity mm -hmm. and this this is really quite uh, conclusive about something so and I think a number of people have got it finally you know you open the New York Times every day there's a message here and it's something about gay identity without hammering it home without having to talk about it a great deal. But it's, in the obituaries, I have found a great truth. Well, there are, there are so many examples of this. Maurice Sindek, the great children's illustrator, died last year. He's considered to be perhaps the greatest mm -hmm. illustrator of childhood terrors and joys. And who better to get into the you know, the real kernel of that than a gay man. And he only really came out in his obituary. The other thing yeah. I wanted to say about this, that I know that in my many conversations with Harry Hay and his partner, John Burnside, they made very clear that, you know, they were all fine for gay and lesbian people having children and raising children and having families. That was not a, a either here or issue. But, for them, but they said the humanity has to understand that what we gay people do are we're raising other kinds of children, <laughs> children of, of, of spiritual gifts, of wisdom, of contribution, that these are our children, and that we ha have a tendency to take care of these children, you know, as much as, you know, the best kinds of parents would take care of their actual children. These are the children of spirit. And we, we, we bear those. I also feel that um, faith itself is undergoing a lot of changes. I, when I think of prayer, I think of a woman on a New York subway at Broadway and 120th Street. 
she's standing because it's packed. And she's not outdoing the Pope in formalistic prayer. But she's praying. Well, then everybody shut up, listen, quit judging the woman, and learn from the woman. So I think it's a time of radical change. And uh, I'm very positive about that in terms of my own life, too, because I'm delighted to be here in that period and to have my life be a part of it. And, you know, learning how in any way we can to bring the sacred, whatever, however you define that, the sacred quality of life more into your everyday life, the life of your neighbors, your friends, your family. And again, that is a calling that I think we queer people hear, even if it's just in the background somewhere. We know it, we hear it. Let's, you know, make, make good on that. That's, that's part of, it's part of why we're here. So therefore, let's be a part of the revolution. Yeah, it just, it seems, it has always <laughs> seemed so clear to me since I was a little boy, walking down on the, the waves there in Big Sur and uh, Carmel. I was uh, pretty much alone, you know, except for my brother. I mean, I had friends and all of that, but I didn't hang out because, you know, I was a queer kid. And aside from my brother, I didn't, uh, was aware of only one or two other queer kids in the neighborhood because it's not a very big town. So those clashing waves and the birds and the beautiful trees, in a sense, became, you know, I don't sound corny or sentimental, but became my friends. I mean, it became part of my inner mm -hmm. world. And I saw how that outer world worked. <laughs> and it was a great lesson yes, for, I yes. think, how we can work. And we clash sometimes, but also can be very harmonious and, and be in imp empathy with, with, and create uh, a mutually sustainable environment that works for everyone and not this house of terror and horror that the world seems to have created for itself. Well, I think the uh, point here is, you know, uh, let's get out of all of the closets that we live in. Uh, let's join the human race. <laughs> uh, I mean, let's change the world. But that doesn't mean another century. And in fact, if we don't change the world now, maybe there won't be another century. Uh, it's immediate. And, and What I like about this is that I think so many uh, can I say gay people and mean everybody rather than go through the alphabet again? Um, I think a number of us may have lost sight of the path or been wounded terribly or hurt or not been able to hear anyone with another message. And I think the uh, presence of this particular hope is huge and can save the lives of so many of these gay people who perhaps are feel defeated, hurt, wounded, out of place, and maybe um, kind of don't believe anybody very much right now. Um, my, I advocate to you 
uh, get with it. I mean, don't live in hell anymore. You don't need to. Just grab onto this hope that we're talking about. And we're not just talking about it. We, uh, it's a part of our life. Oral history is huge, and uh, there's nothing quite like oral history. And, and we haven't done enough with it at all because some people just aren't listening. And I'm suggesting you listen. And some people maybe have given up hope, and I say that's stupid, really, and not going to lead you to anything. And I'm suggesting something very positive here. I mean, live life, take, it, you know. Um, I'm advocating hope and joy and something positive, and I'm well. I mean, what is life? <laughs> we have a few years, don't we? And I, uh, for me, anyway, it's very important because I, I love it. I realize it isn't forever, but it's, it happens to be while we're here. And in that context, I think oral history is, uh, is nothing quite like it. So I'm talking right now, <clears throat> and you're presumably listening, uh, turn me off right now and start talking yourself. I've contributed directly or indirectly to at least 500 issues of The Advocate, the magazine of record for our community. My, my books, like Malcolm's, have gone around the world. And it's basically with the, the theme or with the idea that um, take good care of yourself and know that you are loved and be loved and love others, and then to take that love as a currency and create something with it. You don't, not everyone has to be a, a Michelangelo, <laughs> God forbid, <laughs> but be, you know, do something with it, be something with it, but come from that authentic place to know that you are loved, that you are worthy of love. And, and that is what I think oral history, ultimately, these histories of people, of our forebearers, of our grandfathers, our grandmothers, so to speak, people who have gone through some very difficult places often, yeah. who sometimes didn't know though, that they were loved or what love was or felt, as I said earlier, felt cheated or betrayed of love, but somehow so many managed to survive and come through those desert periods to be witnesses, to be survivors, to be great teachers of wisdom and knowledge. And um, that's why it's very important. Now I'll just say, you're interviewing us here in Los Angeles, California, and I get tired of telling people, I really do, that here in LA down by the University of Southern California, we have the world's largest archive of LGBT history and oral archives and paintings and you know thousands of books and I say have you been down there to see your past have you been down there to see yourself well no I've never heard of this place <laughs> you know a year after I said well just you've got to go down and here it is all sometimes just draw a map on on a napkin or a piece of paper you've got to go down there and I said no I'm going to give you like a week, and then I expect a call, or I'll call you, I'll, I'll find you wherever you are. And invariably, they'll call and say, oh my God, it's like I had a, a spiritual awakening, a, or an awakening of some kind, that I have found like I'm a member of this lost tribe, and that I'm not alone, you know, that I'm not bent or broken or wrong, no matter who said what, when, you know. And I'll just say, you know, the Bible has been rewritten so many times, we don't know what it originally said. 
but I have a feeling that Malcolm and I and all, you know, everyone in that archives were in those early passages. And they were basically saying we were just as loved and respected as anyone else walking on the planet. And we had our special roles within our families, our special duties. This is a theory, by the way, but I think it's, it's, it's real. But you never know what it is and what to do with it until you really get it in your gut. And that's why I think the oral history project is so important because there's people like us telling you that you are loved, you know, and that it's more than okay. And if you're not gay, that's okay. So, <laughs> but if you're gay, I say, wow, that is a really special gift and not everyone gets that one when they open the, the package, you know. And so when you're unwrapping the package of your latest incarnation and they're somewhere in with the other marbles or bits of character, personality, there's that little piece that says, you're a queer person. Take hold of that man and, and find out everything you can about it how other people have lived with it, interpreted it in both ways both positive and negative. Sometimes you can learn as much through the bad examples as you can through the good. Just a matter of uh, bearing, watching, bearing witness, and then taking responsibility for this uh, really, uh, I like to avoid the words magical or marvelous. They sound so, I don't know, kind of faggy or something, fay. But I really do believe that there is a magical, really deep, mysterious quality to being gay. And, and uh, it has always been that way in my life. And I would never uh, have chosen to be any other way than the way I am. The underlying thing for me is kind of being able to be loved. When I look at the world, I do see kind of endless people who don't believe they're loved. And, and in, in a certain sense, one could say, why would they believe in love if they're being destroyed? If they're in a school system where the classes are too large and the teacher's going crazy and the whole thing is a mess because the education is for the 1%. Uh, but I mean, how to feel loved when, in your experience, you're not being loved. And I think the answer for me is to look for the love. And oddly enough, most of us are being loved in one way or another. And so often we're refusing it. And we're hurt and we're perpetuating our hurt. And that leads nowhere. And in my view, uh, the whole point then is to help create a situation for oneself where one is looking at the love that is available to oneself in the structure of life. It takes some work. Yeah. I'd like to finish with just mm -hmm. this one little story about um, my brother and my gay brother and me. He was three and a half years younger, and he was an absolutely gorgeous person. He was a tennis player and surfed and, you know, and so I'm the big brother who decided to go off and go to college, and he's decided to stay in this beautiful, Edenic 
place known as Carmel, California, but it is a small community. So when he got AIDS, he did meet some prejudice and some stigma, and there were a lot of beautiful people who were helping, but it was hard for him at times. And I think he internalized some of that, which made his final days more difficult than they should have been. Um, but he was very ravaged by AIDS. So like a lot of men at that time, he decided that he had to take matters under his own hand, with his doctor's consent, by the way, and his family's consent. We thought we had a family meeting, and we said, Kirk, if you, there was nowhere really left for him to go but for the suffering to magnify. So I said, uh, I will come and I will help you, but I'm not going to do anything. So he took the matters into his, I just turned away and I said, I'll come, I'll come back in a little while. And he did what he needed to do. And he was in his chair and was beginning to fade away. And I came up to him and I held him in uh, my arms. And I said, you know, you've always been loved and I have always loved you. And he said, I have always loved you. So we spent the, the next five or six hours just saying, I love you, Mark. I love you, Kirk. Good journey. We'll see each other again at some point. But it was just that reinforcement mm -hmm. that you were loved. I have loved you. You, you know, that's that doubling reflection until finally he took his last breath but the last words on his lips was that, um, you know, it was about love. And what more can I, Come on. you know, he, he had a happy end. And that's a true story. I hope I don't get into trouble by telling that because it's, you're not supposed to do things like that. You didn't do it. I didn't, but I didn't do anything no. other than come and just tell, remind my brother that he had always been loved, that he was love, and so was I. <laughs>